Hello, I'm Michael, and in January 2023, I finished the capstone of a multi-year project that I was working on in order to figure out and refine some things in terms of software development and deployment in general. If you go back to, if you're able to search Google, um, you will find an article from me called Building a Cross-Platform C++ Program in Allegro, I believe. That article was the springboard for years of research that I did in private that was something that I just wanted to find out, an itch I needed to scratch. So it was totally, totally distinct and separate from anything that I did professionally, and it was a path that I just had to follow. And what I found is that as I got towards the end of this process, right, after having taken a two-year break even, that I was able and ready to put the finishing touches on this process and do what I needed to do to bring closure. But that last 10% or 1% of any project, well, let's not be so uh, extreme and, and absolutist and say any project, I'm sure there are exceptions, but in most cases, that last mile sometimes is the hardest. And so, in this case, I wouldn't say it was hard. None of this is hard. It's all easy, really, at least in hindsight. But I found a number of barriers, and the barriers kind of presented themselves in the form of starting January 14th and ending January 31st, and of course, I wasn't working each day, right? It was maybe three or four days in total, three, maybe four, maybe five days in total in the entire month of January that I actually uh, put the finishing touches on this. But each day that I, I committed to this, it was like something that should only take two hours ended up taking me 10 to 12 hours. I was started like 4 p.m., in the uh, in the evening and I find myself wrapping up around 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning right but I was relentless I just couldn't let it go once I got engaged with it and that story is actually told in other videos but this particular segment that I'm sharing with you is about a situation where you're at the very end and you see a problem with something that's been working so well and for so long that it's like you got to fix it. But when the problem reveals itself, the normal tools that you have available to you that would tell you that there is a problem and even what the nature of the problem is, is totally non-existent. So what do you do when compilers don't tell you anything? The buggers don't tell you anything when there are no error messages and when there is an error message or an error code, it is so non-descriptive as to be totally irrelevant. That's a moment where if you're going to resolve the situation at all and you have nobody else to call, then you realize that you must know the answer. And once you know the answer and once you resolve it and once you see what I went through to get this accomplished, the ultimate lesson is when there are problems, especially in software and technology, sometimes all you have to know is you can solve it. All you have to know is the solution resides in you. If you followed my videos from January 2023, you will know that the overall theme of those videos is the adoption, my successful adoption of GNU Auto Tools as a way to build the software that I've wrote over many years. And my focus is to, or was to, streamline that process and make the creation of the software or rather the translation of that source code into an executable format much smoother and to better integrate that build process with the package build process to create RPMs and DEBs. 
RPMs and DEBs, those are the files that you use to install your software in various environments. And so the operating assumption during this time was that the code that I wrote that I've tested over many years, many months, many nights was working fine and working flawlessly. And so when I pull out an archive database where I've previously downloaded information, right? So that's an example right there, rss.db. When I have one of the archives pulled and I launch the application and it looks into the directory to find that database, it loads it just fine and everything seems fine. But I noticed something when I was doing a demo of the software and I was putting it through its paces, I noticed that it could not actually write new feeds to the database. As in, it could not accept new URLs. And I said, okay, what's going on here? What's going on here? Because everything worked flawlessly the last time I tested it, which was about two years, two and a half years ago. And so my expectation is that if it compiles and if the APIs are the same and everything works the way it should, then everything should be in good shape. But this line that I have highlighted here, that is um, where I'm looking or where I am initializing SQLite. Because one of the things I found was that when I was reading the SQLite documents, it indicated that some of the automatic features that you could rely on in the past, you may not be able to rely on in the future. Let me say that a different way. The SQLite interface, the APIs that I was using, they have drifted in that the APIs are the same on the surface. The way you call the functions, they're the same on the surface. But what they're doing underneath is different. And so I went through this process where I didn't know that at first. And I just blanketly assumed that it had to be a file permission issue. So this line that I have highlighted here, I'm sitting there and it, you can't see it now, but I had done all kinds of alterations to it where I was putting in um, UMask, I was putting in uh, Chmode, I, I say Chmode, others may say uh, CH mode, right? Or, or change mode, whatever way you pronounce it. I was doing Chmode 777, right? 0777. I was doing all those kinds of things, right? And all in the attempt to modify the access permissions at the directory levels, right? So that the uh, directory permissions traverse down to the um, child files in the descendant directories. So, and what made me go down that line of thought was, okay, when I look at the file permissions in the visual file uh, viewer here, it shows that yes, the owner of the directory and the owner of the file has full modification ability on the file, but anyone from the group or others will not have the ability to make any modifications. That's the way I read that. And I read it that way because I know that not every process or every program when you launch it takes on the identity or continue or consistently applies the identity of the, in this case, person or, or uh, account that initiated that program launch. So, you know, so you can't assume that when you're running a program under your user ID that it's using your user ID's permissions for everything because that's just the way security contexts are implemented. And I say that's just the way because it would take too long to explain that in granular uh, depth. But suffice it to say, I made those modifications with the hope that if I were to 
resolve what, what what I had imagined was some file access issue, then that would um, allow the program to to be able to successfully write uh, to the database, to write to the database. So then the thing was is after I made those modifications, it so happened that nothing changed. The the program was unable to write to the database. There were no error messages. There were no error messages generated within the program. There were many attempts uh, made by me to try to get to the bottom of it. And I finally did. And what I noticed was this batch of statements here, which is not software code, it's SQL, it's structured query language, that I've embedded I embedded it and planted it in the program so that it could get issued to the SQL engine. This batch of code, which I had written several years ago, admittedly, in the last modification that I did to it, there are some bugs here that I also noticed. But even when I corrected those bugs and I tested it in the database separately from the program, that that batch of code worked flawlessly. If I take that whole batch of code, it worked flawlessly. But now in the new version of the program, I decided after many hours, I think it was like six or six or eight hours, I said, you know what? There's a more practical way to solve this. And so I went ahead and broke up the statements and I took it out of the transactional structure that I had it in because I really liked that structure. It was like all or nothing kind of thing, right? And that's what I wanted. But so what I, what I opted for here instead, because this wasn't so critical a part of the program in terms of that it had to be in a transactional structure, that was simply a good um, refined way to do that, right? But by breaking it up, that resolved the issue. The thing was is that there were no error messages given by the SQLite API that told would tell anyone that that statement right there is the problem. Nothing at all. You would get a response code of 1, which means there's some kind of error, but it doesn't know what the error is. It's just some general error. So you got a re return code of one instead of zero. Zero indicates success in the world of SQLite. So what this showed me was that the APIs did indeed drift and there was an issue with the way the program worked. So the thing is, is that in the absence of a very specific error message, right? A very specific error message. You, it doesn't. There are no error messages that tell you exactly what's going wrong, and in some cases, there are no error messages at all, unless you dig deep and try to pull out return codes at a at a deeper level and that sort of thing. Then what you're going to find is you must know what the problem is. You must have a model and a real blueprint for how the whole system functions and operates. You have to know without a shadow of a doubt how it's supposed to be and be 100% right about that. And so after more than 20 years of SQL experience, more than 20 years of software programming experience, more than 20 years of systems and operating systems experience, all of that culminated to be able to just look at it and say, you know what, that's what's wrong with it. The API no longer recognizes that syntactic structure and no one implemented a much more deep or granular way to express that to the users of that API. So you have to know that that's the case. And so that's what I established here. And that is what allowed me to uh, successfully move forward on the project, right? Because otherwise I would have been stuck in limbo trying to figure this out.
And limbo is not where you want to be. And then after you do that, you go through your testing processes, right? And my testing processes were basically to rebuild the .deb file in this particular case. Of course, I also have to rebuild the .rpm files. And so, as I went through there, this is another level that I was able to operate at. And that is, as you see these types of issues, you see opportunities for improvement. Have you ever went down a rabbit hole when writing code or building a software program? You went down a rabbit, rabbit hole of what you might call troubleshooting or diagnostics. And in the process of doing that, you find new things that you can improve. You find new problems and you actually uh, reinforce and you refine and you enhance things in a far better way than if you were able to just rest on your laurels and say, oh, it works, everything works fine. So really, problems, trouble, errors, mistakes, flaws, defects are actually the catalyst for improvement in these software systems. I used to look at that sort of thing with a little bit of disdain in the back of my mind. I would be like, okay, here we go again with another update. But the updates are a symptom of evolution. They are a symptom of growth and change. And so as I go through this process of building the .deb file, in this particular case, I'm building it in Debian 11, I'm sitting there reflecting on this process and seeing that, yes, these types of experiences where you drift into the unknown, the unknown of functionality, the unknown of reliability, the unknown of durability, you actually come out of it much stronger, much sharper in your acuity and your ability to identify better ways to architect, design, and structure programs. And so with that, I am, I'm like, pretty pleased with how that that aspect turned out where it's kind of like a seesaw I needed to go down the road of package management and building this this source code into an executable and doing that in a more refined way using the new auto tools but that gave me a little bit of a break in time where I can now look at the program and say okay what lessons can we learn about APIs and about software development where our assumptions are this type of API or this type of development that seem rigorous and seem to be a long-term road to travel at the end of the day may not be and it's one where you have to keep your wits about you and you have to develop better methods of understanding when things change even when it looks like nothing has changed at all. So here I'm in Ubuntu and I'm going through and I am trying to get the .deb file and I'm going to copy the IP address for the virtual machine. One of the things that I have explored in this process as opposed to two and a half years ago was the hybrid model of taking the command line and taking the visual tools and using them simultaneously. And as you can see, if you compare this process to what I shown through videos and blog posts at GaucherTalksTechnology.wordpress.com, you will see that there is an increasingly um, broader presence of visual tools. And when I say visual tools, I'm talking about the file explorers, the file navigation, the virtual machines, the way that they are set up. Um, I'm using less SSH on a persistent basis, and I'm using things as is because I think. 
it's helpful to go through a season in your life in this particular process of where you're fully immersed and it's all command line for you. It builds your muscles, it builds your intuition, and it gives you greater insights into the system. But that's not to say that for the entirety of your time doing software development, whether it's 20 years or it's 40 years, or in the case of Dr. Donald Knuth, what, 60, 70 years? I actually lost track, but 60, 70 years? You can oscillate between the visual and the command line. And in doing so, it improves your expertise. It improves your insight so that you can delve into the systems at whatever level you need to. And as you're doing that, keep good notes. And in my case, I keep good notes through my Git commits. You try to have paragraphs. You write paragraphs in your Git commits, right? You may never read those paragraphs again, but if you end up doing so at some point or somebody else on the team or someone else who wants to collaborate on your project or whatever, then they would be able to do so. So here I'm doing my tests because I've gotten all this, this all the software patches in place and the amount of software change that I had to do, even though I worked on this for what, close to 12 hours, maybe more. I think it, it ended up being 20 hours overall when you just take it all together. Um, but just different parts, not just this. But as I uh, do my test here, right, I'm seeing the, the fruit and I'm seeing the benefit of, of that level of expertise, of that ability to, to diagnose and see where the problems are. And here we are, voila, you're able to operate it the way that it's supposed to operate and things function the way that they're supposed to function. And so uh, that was a good exercise for me. And I hope that for those that can learn something from this, that this will help them see that not everything that you need in order to become an expert in software development right is written in books there are some things that will never be written in books there are some things that can never be taught through formal methods or formal instruction there are some things that simply are a function of the human intuition human insight and the ability to pursue a hunch a gut gut feeling and tap into that innate sense of how systems come together. The formal and the informal, they work together. One is not better than the other. One is not exclusive of the other. You've got to have them together in order to produce innovation. You have to not only know what's in the books, know your theories, your architectures, your models, your data structures, your algorithms, but you also have to know just the flow of your own thinking and the way software developers think and the way end users think and the way systems have evolved. And we all know that each of us don't always do everything that we're supposed to. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I think I kind of tapped into that. When I looked at that API and I was like, you know what? Something's missing here. And rather than ponder that too deeply, I just said, okay, let's solve this problem this other way. And you end up with results. So when push comes to shove and you have to solve a production problem and you have to um, really get things in gear, then don't be afraid of intuition. Don't be afraid of insight. And so here I am testing the same process in Ubuntu, I had tested it in a De the Debian environment. The thing about testing is you want testing to be as comprehensive and as widespread as you can make it. And that's going to be one of the advantages of virtual machines, again, in processes like these. So that's the overview of how you go beyond expert code diagnostics and what it takes to 
really be a software developer practitioner of the technical arts at a higher level. I truly hope that all of this that I shared makes sense to you. And if you need any clarification, do not hesitate to put a comment in the comment feed. And I find this whole process of software development, as long as I've been doing it since the late 1980s, the early 90s, throughout the 2000s, that it offers a great opportunity for us to manifest the things that exist in our mind because all creation comes from the mind. So if this inspired you, please let us know. And if you like to like this video or subscribe if you haven't already, feel free to do so so you can catch up on all the latest that I am sure to share in the future. Thank you.